Hello, uh, my name is Jonathan Diaz. I am legal counsel for voting rights at Campaign Legal Center. Uh, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's book discussion on the Constitution of Knowledge, a Defense of Truth with Trevor Potter, uh, president at Campaign Legal Center and Jonathan Rausch, senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. Campaign Legal Center or CLC is a national nonpartisan organization that works to advance democracy through law at the federal, state and local levels. We fight for every American's right to participate in the democratic process and believe that our democracy should be transparent, accountable, and inclusive. During today's discussion, our speakers will discuss some of the challenges our democracy faces to knowledge and truth seeking in a digital world. So now I'd like to introduce CLC's founder and president, Trevor Potter. Trevor is a Republican former chairman of the Federal Election Commission and served as general counsel to Senator John McCain's 2000 and 2008 presidential campaigns. Uh, he is maybe best known for his recurring appearances on the Colbert Report as the lawyer for Stephen Colbert's super PAC, Americans for a Better Tomorrow, Tomorrow, programming which won a Peabody Award for Excellence in Reporting on Money and Politics. Jonathan Rausch is a senior fellow in the Governance Studies Program at the Brookings Institution and is the author of eight books and numerous articles on public policy, culture, and government. He is a contributing writer to The Atlantic and the recipient of the 2005 National Magazine Award, the magazine industry's equivalent of the Pulitzer Prize. He has authored several books and articles on topics including political parties, LGBTQ rights, marijuana legalization, and religious liberty. Before I turn it over to Trevor to kick off the discussion, I wanna review a few housekeeping items. First, please use the comment section on Facebook or YouTube to submit your questions for our panelists. At the end of the discussion, we will do our best to get to each question, but in the interest of time, we may not be able to answer all of them. So if we're not able to get to your question today, members of the press can email their questions to media at campaignlegal.org, and members of the public can email their questions to info at campaignlegal.org. And now I will turn it over to, Tre to Trevor to begin our discussion. Thank you, Jonathan, very much. John, great to see you, and, and I'm delighted we can have this conversation uh, about what I think is a, a really important book and, and a, a thoughtful book. Uh, let me start with uh, what for me was the obvious question when I first picked it up, which is what exactly do you mean by the constitution of knowledge? Um, how does that differ from the Constitution sitting on paper in the National Archives? Uh, which, what, what was your thinking behind that title? Well, weirdly, they're more similar than you might believe. But I want to preface all of that by thanking you, Trevor, for having me, by thanking you and the Campaign Legal Center for the important work you do. It has never been, I think, as, as urgent as it is right now. Uh, and also to thank you for your now 26 years of, of friendship and occasional guidance and mentorship. Every society, whether small tribe or large country, needs a way to come to some kind of common agreement on what's true and what's not true for public purposes. And humans are, you know, we're pretty good about figuring out what facts are on questions that give us immediate feedback and have immediate impact on our personal lives. Like, you know, where is the next tribe camped? Where is the source of water? Is that a tiger in the bush or just a breeze? We're really not good at the bigger, more abstract moral questions like which God should we worship or the, the bigger, harder questions about reality, like what is the cause of the disease that's killing our kids? So we come up with stuff like, well, you see that woman, she looked at me funny. She's a witch, burn her. And then we divide into sects and tribes. We go to war with each other. We use oppression and violence to settle these questions until about 300 years ago. Some people about the same time the U.S. Constitution was taking shape come along and say, well, let's do that with knowledge too. Instead of having some um, rulers decide what's true, you know, police or public bureaus or princes, other things beginning with P, let's have rules decide what's true. Let's have a big community, reality-based community, I call it, science, journalism, law, government, that's basically in the business of looking for mistakes, correcting each other, um, and they need rules to do it. Well, those rules, the institutions and norms they use, 
things like uh, they've got checks and balances, they've got distributed authority, they've got different branches. They use many of the same rules that the U.S. Constitution uses, all in the service of getting people to get to some kind of common conclusions about knowledge. So that requires some general acceptance of the group of people you listed, scientists, lawyers, educators, etc., cetera, uh, that requires a general societal acceptance of their sorting of, of facts. And yet what I think we see a lot of today, and it usually goes under the phrase of the elites, is a complete rejection of just what you're describing. The, what, what I would loosely call, don't confuse me with the facts, but what you often hear as, um, you know, I don't want the experts telling me what to do. I don't trust the experts. Aren't you talking about the experts when you talk about this um, uh, collection of knowledge? Yeah, for the most part. Really, I, I prefer the term professionals because most people in this community, like you, Trevor, you're part of this community. Every time you write a legal brief, you have to check your facts. You have to have your citations. You can't make stuff up. You can't lie. You'll get in trouble if you do. You're a member of the reality-based community and you're a professional. And you're professionals. Actually, uh, the constitution of knowledge is unusual because it allows for amateur participation without fear of getting thrown in jail by someone who offends you. And yeah, you're right, because this is a professional network and because we live in a populist society, it's under attack. Actually, it always has been since the time of Galileo, who was, as you remember, thrown under house arrest. It's nothing new about skepticism toward intellectual authority, and it's not necessarily a bad thing either. Um, the question is, can we come? It's not that we need to agree on the facts or we need to agree on which specific experts to defer to. But what we do need is some agreement on the basic rules that we agree to follow as we decide what's factual and what isn't. And that's the Constitution. It's like the U.S. Constitution. We don't have to agree on what the law is going to say or which candidate to vote for, but we just do agree that we have this process, right? And that's, that's what unites us, that we have this process. So that's the core of the Constitution of Knowledge that we need to defend. So what is the, in your view, what is the process that we should all be following? What are the, the rules? You lay out a couple in the book, but talk about those a, a little bit. Well, the heart of the book is a discussion of the Constitution of Knowledge, how it works, many norms and institutions, but there are yeah, they're, they're two basic rules at the heart of the whole thing. And they come out of philosophical movements called fallibilism and empiricism that go back to the, the 17th century. And they're, they're both pretty revolutionary. The first says, uh, no one gets the final say. You can't be so certain that you're right that you get to shut down debate, whether it's on a question of who's God or, uh, or anything else. So that gives you free speech and open inquiry. It says that anything, no matter how true we believe it to be, might be subject to question. And then the second rule is the empirical rule, which is no one gets personal authority. It says the way we establish what's true what's knowledge, is by checking, by testing. and But there's a specific way we have to do that. We have to do it impersonally. So anything, any argument that I make or any evidence that I adduce has to be evidence that you can look at and evaluate, an argument that any reasonable person should be able to evaluate. That makes, it's like voting in the U.S. Constitution. That makes the persons interchangeable. So now you can set up this global network of people constantly hunting for each other's mistakes on a scale of millions and millions of minds, all acting interchangeably to check each other. And that's the, I argue, the breakthrough social technology in human history. That's what puts the shot in my arm that's protecting me from COVID right now. So science comes up with um, a a new uh, way to cure a disease, and that can empirically be checked. And if you write an article about it in a medical journal, you have to describe how you did it, and somebody else can go and try to do the same thing. And if, heaven forbid, it doesn't work again and again, then they don't accept your authority. They say you haven't proved what you said you proved. Uh, you... Uh, cite in the book Wikipedia as an example of 
the way in which this can work, where people around the globe can help shape information. Um, do you see that as um, a, a success in, in what you're describing? Yeah, uh, Wikipedia is the most, maybe the only, but certainly the most prominent example of taking the constitution of knowledge, taking the precepts that scientists apply, but also that journalists apply and that you apply as a lawyer. Anyone, any lawyer anywhere in the world should be able to look at your briefs, check the sites, figure out the logic, challenge it if that's what they want to do. Well, Wikipedia replicates that online. And it does that by creating a whole bunch of incentives, like show your work. You have to have citations for everything. Anyone can check any page and make a correction at any moment. It also has supervisors, semi-quasi-professionals who look at pages and help resolve disputes. So it has dispute re uh, resolution mechanisms. So that's, that's unfortunately maybe the only example we have of taking these values and translating them online, because as you know, most of the online world does not work that way. So th this gets us straight into the online world, uh, which it, it seems to me is uh, perhaps the biggest change in the way the constitution of knowledge works in the last 300 years, where all of a sudden we have jumped to hyperspeed in the amount of information being conveyed uh, and the ability of um, what are commonly called trolls, people who don't care whether something is true or not, or know it's not true and still say it uh, because it gives them power. Uh, the, in the, the new online world, um, those people are out there right next to Wikipedia. Uh, how does, in your view, how talk a little bit about how the, the new online world changes uh, the constitution of knowledge that you described as evolving over 300 years in, in a very different environment? Well, not so different as all that. Um, you said this is, you think this is probably the biggest change in 300 years. It may be, uh, but I'd like to remind people radio and TV were pretty darn big. They gave us Hitler and Mussolini in World War II, among other things. The invention of offset printing and the penny press uh, transformed American journalism into basically a cesspool of fake news and hyperpartisanship. It, it took basically 50 years to get ourselves out of that mess. So this is not the first disruption that we've seen. It is unusual, though, as you say, the hyperspeed at which it works um, and the, the business model for the, that sustains the online world is primarily advertising, which means getting people's attention and not caring how you do it. Uh, best way to get people's attention is to outrage them or to appeal to their tribal instincts by saying, what about that outrageous person on the other side? Or using fake news, which you can tune viral, tune to go viral using these you know, bots that will very quickly determine what's viral and, and promote it. So if the whole business model is based not on filtering out the stuff that's false, which is what the constitution of knowledge is busy doing. That's you know what you do as a lawyer. You try to figure out what the facts are and exclude the rest. Well, the business model for social media and digital media generally tends to be more like the opposite, which is if it spreads, put it out there. Uh, if it gets clicks, put it out there. So yeah, that's, that's a very big challenge. It's a difficult problem. The good news is there's a lot that can be done about it. And I think we're already seeing some headway but you know, heck of a long way to go. So w w let us in on that. What are what is the uh, the good news of what can be done about it? What do you, how do you see the misinformation uh, uh, falling to uh, the facts? Well, first the bad news. There's no silver bullet. There's no law you can pass. Um, section, what is it? Three three fifty. Um, You'll, you'll help the me with that. Of the yeah, Communications Act. Decency Act. Yeah. Uh, that's not going to fix it. It's going to be a whole bunch of different things being done by different actors. But I'll tell you the kinds of things that I think we're looking at. The first is you're going to have policy changes, um, which are going to uh, make it harder for trolls to negotiate the online world. We already saw that in the 2020 election, where we saw the platforms do much better jobs 
of keeping election disinformation uh, offline. Second, you're going to see product redesign. And I think actually that's a more promising area than, than legal policy changes. And that's changing the way the product works to incentivize better behavior. A small but significant example of that is now if on Twitter, if you try to retweet a link that you haven't actually read, you'll get what's called an interstitial warning. You'll actually be interrupted and Twitter will say, are you sure you want to retweet this without reading it? Well, that detaches us from our lizard brains just long enough to think, ah, maybe this is fake news. So that slows us down. It adds a bit of friction. Now, that can seem like a small thing, but if you think about all the friction points in your work as a lawyer, all the little bumps in the road, all the little guardrails that say, wait, think about this first and think about all those guardrails that you impose on your junior associates when they hand you a brief. That's how you do it, right? And then the third most important thing, this is how we got out of the the nightmare of 19th century journalism in America. We set up institutions that started providing norms, guidelines. The American Society of Newspaper Editors was formed in the early 20th century. It starts promulgating rules like don't make stuff up, reveal your sources, uh, run corrections. That all had to start somewhere. And then those were adopted by journalism schools, which began opening around the same time, which promulgated them. You had the rise of prizes like the Pulitzer, which incentivized good behavior. And gradually, as journalism became fact-based, the audience flowed with it. The audience liked that better than the cesspool. As the audience changed, the business model changed. Well, flash forward to today, a lot of people are cynical about Facebook's oversight board which is a panel that's attempting to set some rules and guidelines and norms for what does and doesn't go on Facebook, maybe eventually other social media. I don't think that's a cynical exercise at all. That is the kind of thing that has worked in the past. If the rules are pro-social, if it makes Facebook more attractive to people, less toxic, then more people opt in, then maybe other social media opt in. That's how you snowball in a positive direction. I'm not saying, Trevor, that it will work, only that it can work and it's the right tree to be barking up. So two things in there I'd love to talk about a little bit. One is um, when you uh, draw the analogy uh, to lawyers and filing briefs in court and senior lawyers checking junior lawyers and making sure the case actually says what they, they say it says and stand for and those sorts of things. That's all obviously done in a what I'd have to say is a highly regulated environment with bar associations um, that you have to go to law school. You have to get approved, be admitted to the bar. You are, any misconduct is regulated the, by the bar and you could lose your legal license, i.e. your ability to earn a living. Uh, courts can sanction lawyers for misinformation or even for half information, for not citing something uh, that would be relevant. Uh, so that's a, a pretty tiny piece of all the information that's out there, and it works in a regulated environment. But the reason I and mentioned the internet as as such a change is that um, what ninety nine point five percent of the people using the internet uh, and posting on the internet are not in that regulated environment. They, they uh, can say what they want, and uh, it's not clear to me that anyone can check it. Yes, you can go to Wikipedia, and that has the structure you've described. But if you stumble on any other website, you may not know who is financing it, what their perspective is, whether it's all nonsense or whether, in fact, they have a team of people fact-checking. Um, we, we at CLC put up a web page trying to follow uh, first all the litigation over the claims of fraud. And then as increasingly it became clear that the courts were throwing these claims out, they were being disproved by audits, et cetera. Uh, we wanted people to have a place they could go and get factually correct, fact-checked, footnoted information on these all the misinformation that was out there about fraud in the 2020 election. So we have a nice web page, but the reality is we don't have the audience, uh, a fraction of the audience that some of the other sites do out there 
that are spreading misinformation that has been, I think, conclusively rebutted on our page. But they're not reading it. The country is not reading our page. Uh, tens of millions of people are reading misinformation. H how do we deal with that uh, under the, the Constitution of Knowledge framework? Well, the, uh, the whole world does not need to be in the truth-seeking business and is not and should not be in the truth-seeking business. That's a business primarily for professionals. Everything that you just described, the heavily regulated nature of the truth-seeing process is true throughout the reality-based community. Even arguably the most lax wing, which is my wing, which is journalism. It takes years to train a good journalist in what to do, what not to do, how to find sources, how to evaluate stories, how to work with editors. When you think about what a scientist or an academic or a lawyer has to do, sure, all of these are heavily regulated, and, and that's for a reason. A marketplace of ideas is not enough. You need a constitution of knowledge. You need a bunch of these rules and norms to keep us on track and protect us against our, our liability to go down rabbit holes, to confirm our biases, to ignore evidence, and so forth. But not everyone needs to do that for a living. In fact, it's something only a minority will ever do for a living. You don't need all of society or all of the internet to be truth seeking. You just need it to be truth friendly. If you can tweak the business models, change some of these business models in digital media so that they're more likely to amplify true stuff than false stuff instead of the other way around. For example, you can change the relative velocity of disinformation relative to true information. And just slowing down the disinformation can reduce it from, say, page one of your Facebook feed to, say, page five. So, so you explained so, earlier that the business model, though, is the more eyeballs, the better. And that leads to the more sensationalism, the better. How do we change as a as a as an economy, as a society, how do we change that business model? What's, what's the alternative model that rewards thoughtful truth? Great question. I can see why Colbert hired you to, to be his lawyer. We have two opposing dynamics here. One is the original dynamic of the internet being ad-based, get the eyeballs, it doesn't matter how. Increasingly though, we're running into a different dynamic, which is if your product is dangerous and toxic to its users, if it's not a place that they want to be, if it's telling them vote on November 4th, when election day is November 3rd, if it's damaging their health, it becomes a place they don't want to be. Facebook is now saying a lot of the reasons that they're taking the measures they're doing is because they understand a business model in which falsehood, lies spread faster than truth, misinformation, um, spreads faster than good information is not a sustainable business model. And they're right. That's exactly why the newspaper industry reformed in the United States. So the question is, and I, I agree, Trevor, it's an open question, but can we do with social media, digital media, what we did with print media a hundred years ago, which is migrated toward a different business model in which people are going to get true stuff and like that and reward that. Um, if you can do that, then you've got then you've got a good shot. But I, I, I agree with you. We don't know the answer to that yet. I think um, one thing that's, I think, a very big and very positive change over the last five or so years is if you had asked tech executives in Silicon Valley about this problem five years ago, they would have said, it's not our concern. You know, marketplace of ideas, free speech, it's a platform. We don't want to get involved. They have now realized that their business model is not sustainable if it's toxic. And many of the best thinkers in the world in this industry are now focused on the problem of, okay, how can we change the model, both the algorithmic model and the business model? We'll see if they can do it. So uh, your book, I think, correctly lauds the values of free speech and points out that you can't have a conversation uh, the, the conversation that, that you describe um, in the Constitution of Knowledge without free speech. Uh, so that's, that's one side of the equation. On the other side, though, what we're just talking about is having Facebook and others self-regulate and remove from their speech platforms 
uh, people who are spreading disinformation, decline to give them that platform. Is there a tension there between the two? I mean, oh, I know, sure. obviously, we both know legally there's no First Amendment right to speak on Facebook because it's a private company. Um, but you might have to inform some of your uh, your friends on Capitol Hill of that. But yeah, yeah, that's exactly well, right. So they're looking at it saying, well, maybe it should be less private. Maybe we should regulate more of it, uh, which is is shocking hearing that coming from what used to be deregulatory Republicans. But but the underlying, I want to get to the underlying philosophical issue here because uh, you know if if you think they are doing the right thing and moving in your description to a more a uh, healthy professional model by weeding out uh, the fabulous, the people who are just inventing stuff and uh, creating what you call a toxic environment. If, if they are denied the platform to do that, uh, they're going to say, well, you're diminishing free speech, not as a legal matter, but as a reality. It'll be harder for me to communicate. Is, is that a good or a bad thing? Depends how it's done. I think if it's done by the government, it's probably a bad thing. One reason for that is that if Donald Trump is president again in four years, if you give him the tools to regulate the internet, he will use them. And you and I won't like how he uses it. If this is done as part of an iterative process of private actors trying to figure out what actually works in the real world to keep the customers in a healthy environment, to keep the environment itself a place where people want to come, it's basically truth friendly, then yeah, I think it is a good thing. The tension that you discuss, Trevor, you go right to the heart of the matter, is, as I said earlier, free speech is not enough. The, the, the trick to the constitution of knowledge is the dynamic tension it creates between two necessary things. One is, of course, freedom of speech. You can say anything you want. You can believe anything you want. But the other is the discipline of fact. Only some things get to be in the textbooks. Only some things get to be the basis for government policy. Only some things make it through the scrutiny of the courts. Ask Donald Trump and Rudy Giuliani, who took fabulism, nonsense to the courts. Um, so you need to have both of those things. And the discipline of fact does not shut people down, doesn't put people in jail, but it does sometimes say, you know what, what you're saying isn't true, and we have a right to disamplify it. We're not going to throw you in jail. We're not going to forcibly shut you up. But we're going to say on this website, we favor stuff that's been fact-checked over stuff that's been found false. Um, you don't even need to kick people off, it turns out. Usually, you can just change the algorithms, which are already there, um, so that you're, you're accelerating uh, the truer stuff rather than the false stuff. But yeah, there's a certain amount of discipline involved. I would say to my libertarian friends who don't like any of those mechanisms and see them as constraints, that all of these social media sites, digital media, have been curated and selective from day one. Uh, they were just curating in a way that's hostile to truth. So the question is, can we curate it a different way instead? But there never will be a type of Facebook which doesn't make decisions about what in this global glut of information is, is going up on people's Facebook page. So when that happens and Facebook does that, the, the physics response to that, everything, every action having an equal reaction, is to create a new site that won't do that and where all the people who were putting up the inf misinformation can now go to. Now, under the laws of economics and the way the world works, that may be an unsuccessful new site. Uh, in that it won't have as many people on it as Facebook did, uh, but it, it will then be a siloed site where all that information is still there for the people who are not going to have any fact checking in their news. Yeah, store. sure, sure. And of course, that's that's always been the case. There have always been all kinds of places you can go for, for non-science, you know, for your patent medicines or for your creationism or for your astrology. Uh, people can teach this stuff to their kids. That's You want that in a free society because you never know. Maybe some of the weird, crazy stuff out there that looks toxic, like, you know, the claim that the coronavirus might have escaped from a, a lab. Maybe they're onto something, right? So you want a world where this information is out there. You just also want a world with pumps and filters 
that make it likely that as the information cycles through the system, goes from one website to another, moves through Facebook and Twitter, that over time, actually pretty quickly, you hope, it's going to filter through the more reliable information. But, but you never want someone in charge saying no one can say X or Y. That's, first of well, all, but, illegal but, uh, yeah. and unnecessary. But that does get to the fact-checking side. And, and I guess the underlying question I I'm, I'm have in my mind as I'm listening to this is, is there any mechanism for these social media entities uh, using um, artificial intelligence or whatever to be able to fact check as things come along or to ask questions so that when someone says, um, if you have COVID, you need to take this horse worming medicine, um, that is checked in real time. And the reader then gets a site to the um, CDC uh web page that says this is dangerous, don't do it, is, is I mean, that would sort of be, be a way to implement your constitution of knowledge where people were presented with um, a, a range of information, but, but as it were, right. noted. Or, or contextualized. So again, the bad news is no silver bullets. The good news is that there are some super smart people working on exactly that right now. And then it's going to be these are people out of the Duke reporting lab at Duke University, Bill Adair and his team. And they're working with Google and Facebook and other social media companies. It's going to be some combination of artificial intelligence, which surfaces new stuff as it appears online, new claims, coupled with human fact checkers from around the world who are now organized into a global network in over 50 countries around the world to create databases of checked information, which then the websites can plug into to get a sense when they see a claim. So has this been checked? Should we promote it or demote it or do something else? Put up a put up a, a contextual claim or you know do nothing if they don't want to do these things. Um, so all of that is currently being worked on, and it's it's a very interesting way to think about. It. I don't think we know yet which of these things will work. But I think your question is on exactly the right track. What we've done in the past with the reality-based community is figure out ways to put empirical tests, multiple checks and balances into the process before something is accepted as knowledge, just to slow it down, to double check it. Have you looked at this and that? Maybe we can, to some significant extent, automate it. One reason to be hopeful is that contrary to popular belief, the biggest source of spread of disinformation, misinformation, and fake news is still the oldest, the one you know and love, politicians, by far. And they're usually pretty transparent about what they're saying. So it's pretty easy to find the big new claims politicians are making and react to those very quickly. Well, that leads to the reality of today's life. When, when I was growing up and first absorbing news, it was either newspapers or the evening news. And there were three evening news channels and they were curated and they were footnoted. And there is no way that something got on those that hadn't gone through a process. Uh, today, uh, we have, never mind the, the internet and Facebook and everything we've been talking about, but if you just look at uh, the news operations of the various networks, you would get a completely different worldview. One does uh, watching Fox than one would uh, watching the uh, PBS, say, or, or one of the three networks. Um, and so that politician you're talking about is either going to appear on one of those or the other silo and not going to be challenged. Certainly, you know, uh, I, I think less so actually on, on Fox, where uh, that will be magnified and that's all people are going to hear. So how do we deal with Cor that? Correct. I'm, and I'm, I'm glad you went there, Trevor, because we all tend to talk easily, endlessly about social media because it's the big new disruptive thing. But in fact, the bigger threats are the older threats, which are still very much with us. And that's politicians. Um, who are now deploying, this is Donald Trump, MAGA, I argue institutionally, the Republican Party are now, for the first time in American history, deploying mass disinformation tactics of the, of the Russian style, 
in American politics. They now have, as you point out, their own dedicated media that will repeat and amplify this stuff. You mentioned Fox. Evidence, a lot of empirical work is showing that Fox News and One American Network uh, and Newsmax and others, and also a lot of conservative talk radio, do not behave epistemically the same way that so-called mainstream media behave. Mainstream media, still true of the three major networks, for example, and the major newspapers, whether they're center right all the way to left, will typically check stuff. And if it doesn't check, they'll typically not repeat it or it'll die out after a few news cycles. Fox's model seems to be more attuned to give the viewers what they want. And if it's a conspiracy theory and if it's fake, if it's Sean Hannity talking for a month about uh, Seth Rich being murdered, made up, not true, they do it. So I think to me, a bigger worry in many ways than social media, because there's no technological fix, is the epistemic secession of a lot of the right-wing world, a lot of the conservative world, um, into its own sphere, where it's less and less reachable by the constitution of knowledge and less and less committed to the principles of fact-checking and basing in reality. It's not all the way there yet, uh, but that's the direction, and that's that worries well, me. And, and it becomes an echo chamber. Uh, and you know, we, We're seeing that uh, uh, across the board, where uh, you saw the, if you look at the reporting on uh, what we call the Arizona fraud it, uh, which is to say the, the non-professional, uh, clearly uh, uh, biased uh, r review of ballots in, in Arizona uh, done under circumstances that, that mean whatever they produce will be questioned as uh, n not having abided by normal rules of how you preserve ballots and, and ensure they are not uh, changed and so forth. If you look at that and the reporting on that, uh, on the Fox side and certainly the Trump side, it is all um, this is happening and and it's it's exciting and it's going to change what we think happened in the election. And thus, the people who are watching that reporting say, well, why don't we do it in Michigan, which is what they're now looking at doing. Uh, yeah, and they tried in Pennsylvania going, too. Those people are not going to hear what I've just said that that this is in fact not this is a fraudulent audit and a partisan one and not subject to what you're describing, which is the uh, the questions and the cross checking that is required in in any sort of official election. Yep. It's it's but a whole different. It's a whole different epistemic model. I'm glad you mentioned it. As you know, Phoenix is my hometown. Stephen Richard, the Maricopa County recorder there, who is a Republican, who has been a hero in resisting the so-called audit, the fraud it, is a personal friend. Uh, what's going on there needs to be understood as a form of information warfare. This is about deliberately spreading lies and conspiracy theories in order to confuse the public. And there are all kinds of ways to do that. One is disinformation theater. And that's what they're doing out there. And other states are picking up on it. This is worrying first because it should never happen in America. And it didn't uh, since the 1850s. But second, because it has now escaped the bounds of just Donald Trump, the best, I argue, disinformation agent since the 1930s, uh, a true virtuoso at what's, what they, what's been called the, mm -hmm. the fire hose of falsehood tactic of spreading so many lies so quickly that no one can keep up. But this is now morphed beyond Trump. It's now part of the Republican base, the MAGA base. We're now seeing it spread from state to state. So epistemic secession is deeply dangerous to democracy. We did see it before in America in the 1850s. Inf uh, agents of disinformation, we know their names. We know how they did it. It's in the historical record. Wallpapered the South with conspiracy theories and disinformation about how the North was embarked on a campaign to invade the South and destroy their way of life and make all the women marry black men and so forth. Um, this did not end well when they lost touch with reality in the South. And we're headed down that road again. Well, that's a pretty gloomy uh, thought. I, I guess <laughs> not on geographic grounds, uh, which makes it, of course, more complicated. Uh, if you, I mean, sure, there you sure. had the North and the South and you could figure out who was who, uh, here we're, we're 
much more mixed up. I guess you could argue they're pieces of the rural West, uh, but then there are large urban centers in the rural West, which would, would come out differently. Um, but so how did, I mean, how did things get righted in the 1850s? <laughs> well, we, yeah, I was going to say we had this, this unpleasantness for a period of about five years. And then we decided not to go down that road again. The best, so these techniques of disinformation, they're very powerful. They're very well known, over a century old. Hitler used them, Goebbels, Lenin. Putin is a master of them. In a democracy, the really the only good way to cope with them that consistently works is prevention, which is not to use them. So that genie's out of the bottle, right? Um, what I'm trying to do in this interview and others is give people a sense of hope without complacency. So these tools are, are tried and true. They're well understood by information experts. There's a lot that can be done about them. We've talked about some of these things. Um, but we have to understand the threat. We have to understand the problem, which is the deliberate use of information warfare, epistemic warfare, to divide, disorient, dominate, and ultimately demoralize the American public, confuse them about truth, about whether it's even possible to have truth, make them cynical about all authority so that they will say, well, it doesn't, I never know what's right. Maybe what, you know, maybe what I'm, what I'm hearing about, you know, sunlight curing coronavirus is true. Um, this is a deliberate campaign, but to the extent that people understand what's being done to them and begin to push back, and that we are starting to see that, we can make ourselves as a population a lot more resilient to these tactics. We will never get rid of disinformation but we can think of it as kind of an epidemic, right? Can you contain it? Can you reduce its virality? Can you build some immunity to it? The good news is we're already seeing that. The media are much savvier. We now have watchdog groups all over the world that are inside the disinformation network, seeing what they're doing, understanding it better. Um, we're seeing individuals who are getting better informed, schools in a lot of countries, not enough here, unfortunately, are starting to teach um, digital literacy which helps, we're seeing civic mobilizations like Braver Angels, which I'm a part of, which is about depolarizing. That's super important because the goal of this kind of propaganda is to, to divide us. That's why Vladimir Putin you know, uses his trolls to stimulate contrary protests across the street from each other. That's what Trump is doing with Liberate Michigan, divide us over masks. To the extent we can come together we are less vulnerable to propaganda demonizing the other side. So the question is, in an all of society approach, can we bring these things together in a way that begins to reverse the vicious spiral that we're in? And the answer is, I don't know yet. I don't think anyone knows yet. But the first step is understanding the problem, which is why I wrote this book. Yeah. Okay. Well, I do want to get to why you wrote this book, um, but I think we've got some questions in the stack here ready to go and and uh let's take a look at that um and here we have one you and i can see on the screen i think everyone else can um what about the more transparency on where the disinformation is coming from uh so that we know who is is speaking to us that's an area that campaign legal center has uh fought hard for in the areas of political speech who is paying for these campaign ads uh, the Supreme Court has said that it's important for citizens to know where who is speaking to them and who is funding that speech. Uh, and there, there are laws on the books that, that are not being enforced that would uh, require that for political speech. But if you go beyond it, uh, how do we get transparency on who is who is speaking and whether it's funded by Vladimir Putin or or the, the Chinese. So thank you, Christopher LeDuc. Here's, I'm, I'm, I'm both bad cop and good cop today. I've got lots of bad news and lots of good news. Here I have pretty much entirely good news. In just the five years since 2016, we've seen a step change in the ability to track, understand, and reveal the sources of disinformation. Um, 2016, we were like, blah, 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 blah. no one knew what was going on. We now have academic research centers, uh, people in governments around the world tracking this stuff, understanding it. Uh, we've got whole professions now 
that are organized around identifying this information and trying to stay on top of it. We also have a much more savvy press corps. In 2016, I'm a journalist, right? We just, we just took what we were told and, and put it in. Now we're much better at contextualizing it, explaining high up in the story where this information might have come from, why it might be disinformation, not putting it in in the first place. If the source is dicey, we have reporters at all the major outlets who now cover disinformation. So the news here, and we've also got a much more elaborate fact-checking network. That's expanded as well. So the, the transparency, making people aware of the context, the reliability of the information is crucial. And that's one of the stages where we've seen, I think, the most progress. So John, I, all of, doesn't all of that apply to what you have referred to as the mainstream media? The, that's who is doing the fact checking and researching and looking at where the disinformation is, is coming from. Uh, what about uh, uh, channels of communication that, that aren't doing that? Um, if it gets into the mainstream media, I agree uh, that the facts will be either disputed or, or footnoted. But what, what about you know, someone sends you a link and it's a website and it has a uh, scandalous piece of information on it or a shocking piece of information. How do we, what are the tools to know where that, what that website is and where they're getting it if they're not exercising the, the sort of background checking that you're describing? Well, you can't put all of this on individuals because it's just going to be too hard, which is one of the reasons it's important to, uh, to have uh, media companies get involved and do some intermediary intermediating here to to help people understand uh, where information is coming from and yeah to some extent you got to rely on on people's information hygiene to do a better job than they've done but I think a lot of it really is about giving people better tools sure there are some QAnon hard diehards out there who are just going to believe weird and crazy stuff and think that the comet pizzeria, has a Hillary Clinton sex trafficking ring in the basement. And, and those people have always been out there and it's a free country, right? So you don't need everyone. You just need enough of a critical mass of, of fact-based information so that more people are making better decisions most of the time. Uh, that's, that's been enough for democracy until now. And I, I, hope it, if, I hope if we can get to that critical mass, it will be again. Can I give you a guarantee? No. So you mentioned QAnon. Um, whatever that is, we have no idea where it's coming from. Uh, it has channels of uh, dissemination. Uh, what can other entities do about that? Uh, I don't mean shut it down, but I mean in terms of putting it uh, in any sort of context or giving us greater insight as to where this is coming from. Oh, I think I'm, I'm not an expert on QAnon. My impression is actually we know quite a bit about where it's coming from and, and how it's spread. And it's kind of merged with two other things. One is anti-vax and the other is MAGA, you know, stop the steal. They've, they've mm -hmm. all kind of merged into some kind of big grand conspiracy theory that's kind of viral. And how that spreading has actually been, been pretty well tracked. Uh, most people do not believe in that stuff. And that's important to remember. And you're never going to squelch it all. And again, you never need to squelch it all. It's a, it's a free country. What you do need to do is understand where it's coming from and give people tools to understand that better. You know, most people, most of the time, would rather believe true stuff than false stuff, most of the time. Um, not all the time, you know, for sure. Uh, we we want to believe things that that meld with our, our party or our tribe. Uh, now I'm repeating myself. I think transparency is a big piece of it. And I think slowing the spread of this stuff, disamplifying instead of amplifying is a big piece of it. But it's it's not just any one thing, right? It's all of the above. Yeah, I mean, I think part of this is the, the tribe is the right phrase. Uh, when the parties were less monolithic, which is not that many years ago, and there were conservative Democrats and there were liberal and moderate Republicans. There wasn't a single party line, but for a country which is increasingly polarized and thinks of itself as a Republican or a Democratic uh, voter, uh, the fact that the party lines have become more monolithic, uh, that 
people like Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger are essentially cast out of the Republican Party because they're demanding fact-based investigations uh, makes it, I think, harder because the you're right, the average person out there doesn't want to do the research themselves, but they are inclined to believe party leaders and the, the party line. So when you have a party leader like the former president who is pushing disinformation, people are inclined to believe it because of who it's coming from. Absolutely. Uh, and, and, and that makes it, I think, significantly more dangerous. Absolutely. And this is where I continually put emphasis, not on social media, not even on QAnon. The fact that you had a president of the United States applying Russian style mass disinformation um, to the American political system, and that he then won his party over to doing that and won conservative media over to doing a lot of it, that I think is the biggest I think the biggest threat to democracy we we face right now, um, and it is not symmetrical. I come from the center right myself. I have supported and voted for many Republicans, uh, but right now the Republicans are the seed of this problem. That we just don't see Russian-style mass disinformation about, for example, who won elections from the Democratic Party. We do see it from the MAGA movement, uh, and we see it pushing its its trade craft through every channel, uh, not just conservative media, social media, but more importantly, the political bully pulpit, elected officials, uh, and even the courts are being used for a massive mis disinformation campaign. We're seeing it in Phoenix right now. One of the most important things that needs to happen is for more conservatives and more Republicans to do what Stephen Richer and the four Republican Maricopa County supervisors have done in Arizona, which is to say enough already. Mm -hmm. We've got to stay fact-based as a party. We cannot spread lies and disinformation that is bad for democracy. It is bad for our party. Um, it is not sustainable and it is just wrong. And if enough people do that in the Republican party, I think it will make a difference, but we're not, I mean, you tell me, Trevor, is, is that going to happen? Yeah, it's interesting that, you know, both of us having Republican roots and we're looking at this, at least everyone I know who has uh, been deeply involved in the Republican Party keeps saying this is not Republicanism. Uh, so let me give you a piece of, of good news, which is uh, you talk in the book about how, and we have on this conversation about how lawyers uh, are held to standards which require proof. And implicitly, uh, if they fail to meet those standards, there, there is a penalty to pay. And we are seeing that today. Granted, it is slow moving, but we are seeing courts coming out and sanctioning lawyers. Uh, you probably saw the Lynn Wood, uh, I guess it was the Sidney Powell situation in Michigan, where the court said, you, you didn't do any research. You didn't check any of your facts. You filed papers that were demonstrably false without uh, having checked uh, in advance, uh, officers of the court cannot do this. Uh, and so she will be at risk of losing her license. And, and the New York bar has already suspended uh, Rudy Giuliani from the practice of law based on what he did. Uh, now they will go ahead uh, and, and have a full investigation and, and a, a public hearing, I believe, on it. But that there is a penalty out there for people in who use the court system and filings to spread disinformation that they either know is false or that they haven't done the basic work of checking first. And I think that's good news for our political system because it will make it less likely that lawyers next time will take disinformation political talking points and run to court and file suits and make arguments in court uh, that are full of disinformation because they're suddenly going to know that they would have be vulnerable to paying a professional penalty for that. And so the system in that sense is working. Now, I think we have another question or two, and I don't want to uh, cut those off. So let's see, what do we have? That's a great question. I was wondering the same thing that Gary Moorhead is asking, which is you talked about how uh, there was a world of yellow journalism uh, and uh, things were, were 
actually there was a lot of misinformation and it changed. Uh, and you've talked about the Pulitzers and other ways that good behavior is rewarded. But but why did it change? Why didn't people uh, keep buying the, the sensationalist newspaper headlines, uh, even if they were false? A couple things, to my understanding, and they're still the same things that will tend to inflect where we wind up in today's world, 100 years later. One is a sense of civic responsibility on the part of people in the world of journalism, a reassertion of the values of the reality-based community. And Trevor, that's what you were ref referring to just now. Um, the founders warned us that the Constitution is just a piece of paper, and if people don't take its, its norms, its values, its demand seriously, it'll, it'll simply fade away. And what you're describing is members of the reality-based community asserting the importance of those rules, pushing back, saying, nope, there are right and wrong ways to do things. So that was a factor. And the second was just commercial. They realized that if they became toxic environments for their readers, um, that they would fade away, that their business model was self-defeating because you know you could just keep ex escalating the, the garbage. Um, but ultimately, you undermine your, your own readership. And, and Facebook is publicly saying exactly the same thing today. They're doing the oversight board because they think a model in which, you know, you get on Facebook and people tell, us, tell you vote on Wednesday, um, they think that's an unattractive place for business. So will that translate into strong enough incentives to shift the business model? Today? I don't know. But we do have precedents that show it can happen. Interesting. Thanks. Um, I think we have at least one more question coming up. Ah, from Catherine Gale, who, as you know, has been working. Uh, Hi, Catherine. Yeah. Uh, our current Good election. Good to see you. Our current election system supports federal politicians making divisive, fact free claims because they win primaries. Uh, shouldn't we fix that, i.e., get rid of party primaries so that incentive is reduced? Trevor, you should answer that question. You're at the Campaign Legal Center. Um, I am, I've come to believe, this is a whole separate conversation, but Catherine, I have come to believe that our current primary system is the single most messed up aspect of our politics, that it's selecting in some of the most sociopathic people in America. It's not even representative in my view. So I'm very interested in the kinds of experiments that you and Trevor and others are running to figure out how to, how to do the nominating in ways that create better incentives. That said, uh, I don't think eliminating primaries will get rid of the misinformation and disinformation. On the Republican side, unfortunately, I'm seeing corruption in the base. I'm seeing now, Trevor, you tell me if you think this is right, but whereas I used to think I was seeing supply push from people like Donald Trump and Rudy Giuliani and Fox News that were pushing out misinformation, I think we're now seeing the it's demand pull. I think we're now seeing the base increasingly take the lead in demanding that their narratives and that their stories um, get out yeah. there and the rest of the party being dragged along behind it. And I don't think primaries fix that. But Trevor, what is your take on this? Well, I, I think it depends on what you call the rest of the party. I, I agree with you. I think there are party leaders across the country and there are elected officials in the House and the Senate uh, who disagree with Trump, with the lies about the election, uh, would like to uh, move past that conversation, which they think is nonproductive, uh, are out there telling people to get vaccinated and ignore the the false information people are getting about vaccines, uh, genuinely worried that they're going to lose their voters to fatal COVID. Uh, so I, I think the leadership out there in many cases is nervous about all this. Uh, and you're right, they are in a hard place because they're being attacked if they stick their head above the parapet and the base is going to reward their opponents. That's why you're seeing these divisive primaries. Uh, and why Trump is is and people in in that wing of the party are going after anyone who looks as if they're questioning this disinformation. Uh, but I think uh, we we work uh, uh, with with uh, Catherine Gale and and have supported the idea of the four and five person top choice 
uh, alternatives as a way of saying, okay, if you have, let's look at Alaska, if you have a situation where the party base is going to seize control of the party and produce extremist candidates, then the voters, the rest of them, don't have to live with that as one of their only two choices. You can have uh, four or five choices in the general election, uh, and the voters will have an opportunity to choose someone else if they don't like what the party has produced. So that's the old, uh, you know, the, 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 the dog food line. The problem with it is the dogs don't eat it. If you only give them one type of dog food, they don't have a choice. If you can give them multiple types, uh, then, they, then I think uh, with the advantage of the constitution of knowledge, they can make some choices among these, these politicians. So I well think said. we I think we're at the the almost the the end of our hour and and so I have a a, a final question to you it's a softball I assure you but uh, where can people I, buy I, the book I, well there are two why did you write this now and I assume we can buy it all over the place but but start with we'll take both of those. Uh, I wrote this now because I was starting in 2014 and 15. I was seeing a, a trickle of worrisome attacks on the Constitution and knowledge, both from the right and the left. We haven't really talked about cancel culture and all that, but that's a big part of my book, and it's a big part of the problem. It's a different kind of information warfare, but it's also causing distortions in our political system and environment. And... I started work on the book, and then in 2016, we saw something completely new in American politics, which was the use of mass disinformation by Trump in his 2016 campaign. In that campaign, according to PolitiFact, of the statements by both candidates that they checked, about a quarter of Hillary Clinton's claims were mostly or entirely false. That's too many, but that meant two-thirds of what she said was mostly and entirely true. Donald Trump mostly or entirely false, 70%, 70 percent, seven zero percent. If he opened his mouth, he was probably lying. That's the deployment of deliberate disinformation, Putin style. And that's what got me really alarmed and said, OK, this is something different. This is a step change. What's going on there? So that's why I said we got to write down what's in the Constitution of Knowledge. How do we defend it? That is a great way to to summarize this and to get people to go off and buy your book. Uh, so uh, I hope they will do so. And uh, available at fine bookstores everywhere, as well as Amazon, Barnes and Noble online and everywhere else. Well, thank you for this conversation. Uh, this is this has been a really exciting, uh, I think, back and forth. Uh, we all understand the threats we face better. And you are addressing them by getting us to think about this through your book, and the Campaign Legal Center is addressing them uh, every day as we fight uh, for our democracy through law. So, we can thanks. never assume our democracy is safe. Thank you very much for having me on the program, but especially thank you for the good work that you're doing. It has never been as important as it is right now. Unfortunately, I agree with you. Thanks. <laughs>